Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org. And for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. This week on NJ Business Beat, raising taxes on the wealthiest Americans. What President Biden's budget proposal means for New Jersey. Plus, we have to take very deliberate action in reversing that. Newark leaders concerned about financial discrimination as two banks plan a merger. And as the nation celebrates women for Women's History Month, we highlight the challenges women still face in the workplace, from pay equity to work-life balance and opportunities for leadership roles. That's ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining me on NJ Business Beat. The wealthiest Americans would face tax increases under a $6.8 trillion budget proposal put forward by President Joe Biden this past week. The spending blueprint aims to raise revenue with higher taxes, but also commits $3 trillion toward deficit reduction over the next decade. Much of what's in the proposal is unlikely to fly in the Republican-controlled House, but it's seen as a preview of policies that Biden would push for in a re-election campaign. Biden's plan seeks a 25 percent minimum tax for those with incomes over $100 million, and he wants to raise the corporate tax rate to 28 percent from the current 21 percent. He also calls for national paid family and medical leave. He wants the $35 price cap on insulin for seniors expanded to all Americans, and he seeks free universal preschool. Some of the tax increases proposed by President Biden would reverse tax cuts made in 2017 by former President Donald Trump. No billionaire should be paying a lower tax than somebody working as a school teacher or a firefighter or any of you in this room. So my plan is to make sure the corporations begin to pay their fair share. It used to be 35 percent. We cut it down to 21 percent. I think we should be paying 28 percent. There's going to be a real fight in that, but we should be paying more than 21 percent. February was a good month for job hunters. The government's monthly jobs report showed 311,000 new positions were added to the U.S. economy last month. That was much stronger than economists expected. And it came after a big surge in job creation in January. Much of last month's hiring was in the hospitality industry. The nation's jobless rate ticked up slightly to 3.6 percent, and the pace of wage growth slowed a bit last month. All in all, recent economic data continues to show the job market is resilient, even after the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates to try to cool economic growth. Small bank mergers are a dime a dozen, and usually deals get done without much fuss. But that's not the case here in New Jersey, where advocates are making noise over a proposed merger between Provident Bank and Lakeland Bank. Lakeland has been accused of redlining, a discriminatory lending practice against people of color. Last fall, Lakeland Bank agreed to pay millions to settle claims of illegal lending practices. As senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, Newark Mayor Raz Baraka and others want to make sure the banks adhere to the conditions outlined in that settlement if the merger goes through. We're not talking about 1935. Hmm. We're not talking about 1955. We're talking about 21st century redlining right here, right now. Redlining is a discriminatory practice of denying someone a loan or other financial service because they live in a neighborhood considered a high financial risk. It's most often people of color living in poor communities. It's a practice that Lakeland Bank in New Jersey was recently charged with. In September um, of 2022, the United States Department of Justice 
entered into a historic $13 million consent order with Lakeland Bank for engaging in a pattern or practice of lending discrimination by redlining in the Newark metropolitan area. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibits housing discrimination based on race, color, and other factors. But New Jersey Citizen Action's analysis of Lakeland's mortgage data for 2018 to 2021 in Essex, Somerset, and Union counties found loans to black residents only consisted of 1.7 percent of its total loans. Lakeland Bank was charged with violating the Fair Housing Act and denying low and moderate income black and Hispanic consumers access to credit with reasonable interest rates and clear terms and conditions. Under the DOJ's consent order, Lakeland Bank has to open two new locations, one in Newark, but Lakeland might soon be purchased by Provident Bank, headquartered in Jersey City. And that has advocacy groups like NJ Citizen Action joining forces with Newark Mayor Roz Baraka and others, asking the Federal Reserve to hold the merged bank to the same requirements as the consent order and then some. Regulators, local Local leaders and housing and racial justice advocates must demand more from the banks operating in New Jersey in order to end redlining once and for all. Beyond the consent agreement with the Department of Justice, we need agreements. We need CRA agreements with community stakeholders for the Lakeland Provident merger. Provident Bank, in a statement to NJ Spotlight News, quote, agreed to assume all of Lakeland Bank's obligations under the DOJ consent order and will continue to adhere to all elements of the DOJ consent order. A CRA agreement is a Community Reinvestment Act agreement. New Jersey Citizen Action recently filed charges with the Federal Reserve asking that any merger approval between Provident and Lakeland must include CRA agreements, and specifically targeted to Newark, a region where predatory lending practices, redlining, and price gouging have contributed to generational poverty. Which tells you why these communities uh, are suffering and look the way they look very deliberately and, and, and it means that we have to take very deliberate action in reversing that. That's why we stand with uh, New Jersey Citizen Action and uh, asking the Federal Reserve uh, before they, uh, you know, sanction this agreement, sanction this uh, merger, that they should enforce uh, what the consent order uh, said by the Department of Justice. NJ Citizen Action was surprised to see a detailed letter come from the Federal Reserve last month in response to their challenge filed in December. For the first time in my 38 years here, we received a letter, a five-page letter from the New York Fed, and more than half of that letter spoke directly to the demands that we have put out, how many mortgages, how many subsidies, who they've given it to, what are the incomes, and where do those people live. NJ Citizen Action is meeting again with Provident Bank later this month to discuss the potential terms of a CRA, while the Federal Reserve considers whether to approve the merger between Provident and Lakeland Bank, and whether to include the demands made by NJ Citizen Action. For NJ Business Beat, I'm Joanna Gagas. The Murphy administration has made the development of workplace apprenticeships a priority. And this past week, the State Department of Labor announced the availability of $4 million in new funding through the Growing Apprenticeships in Non-Traditional Sectors, or GAINS, program. That program looks to develop new and existing apprenticeship programs in all sorts of fields, including nursing, cybersecurity, plumbing, preschool education, and massage therapy, just to name a few. State Labor Commissioner Robert Asaro Angelo says one particular focus of the GAINS grants is to promote equality and economic fairness. Two thirds of our apprentices in our GAINS programs are women of people of color, which is double uh, the regular average for apprenticeship programs. So we've been very focused on that uh, in the way that we write these grants and our opportunities for funding uh, and make sure we're partnering with employers who have that as a goal in mind as well. Throughout New Jersey in March, events are being held to celebrate Women's History Month, and we're using the opportunity to put New Jersey's working women in focus, looking at the achievements made by women and the challenges that remain in the workplace. Well, here is a huge hurdle. Working women have yet to achieve equality on pay. On average, women earn 82 cents for every dollar a man earns, according to an analysis from Pew Research Center. The gap is even wider for women of color. What's disheartening is that the pay gap has barely budged in 20 years. Two decades ago, women were earning 80 cents to every dollar earned by their male co-workers.
For working women, the pandemic brought workplace challenges that continue to unfold today. According to a Women in Work 2022 report from Deloitte, many women made decisions about their lives and careers driven by their experiences during the pandemic. That includes seeking new, more flexible work options and in some cases, leaving their employer or the workforce entirely. And women are reporting what Deloitte calls alarming levels of stress and burnout. 53% of women surveyed report higher levels of stress than a year ago, 46% report feeling burned out, and 33% have taken time off for mental health challenges. The majority of women say they've experienced harassment at work, everything from unwanted physical advances, repeated disparaging comments, or microaggressions. Those experiences were reported by 52% of women in 2021, and that number increased to 59% last year. Women are also more likely to be looking for a new role. The Deloitte survey found 10% of women were seeking a new job, and more than half, 52%, say they want to leave their employer in the next two years. But it's not all negative. Women are making strides and charting their own path to success. There are also more women sitting on corporate boards, and the number of female executives is on the rise. I spoke about this with Courtney McCormick, president of Executive Women of New Jersey. Courtney, it's great to talk to you today. Thank you again. So delighted to be here. What are we seeing in New Jersey in terms of female executive leadership? Are we seeing enough diversity on boards? Are women rising through the ranks? I think they are, Rhonda. I think I'm very happy to report that we are seeing a positive trend in female representation at New Jersey companies, whether in leadership roles or on the boards of directors of such companies. Um, we've seen that between somewhere between 2010 and 2020, an increase in female representation between roughly 21% to 47% of S&P 500 companies. However, work remains to be done. Where we see some, some lagging trends really has to do with representation among racial minorities. What else needs to happen to create an environment for women to achieve? You mentioned some flexibility at the workplace. What about the role of mentoring and making sure that the opportunities are presented to women? Absolutely. One thing at EWNJ we spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about is the distinction between a mentorship and a sponsorship. And both of those things are very important. And I'd say for companies to really do it well, you have to start with the tone at the top. It has to be something that's that the leader within the organization, the leadership, really articulate, articulates as being a corporate value. Now, mentorship really speaks to how do you find those relationships with folks where you can have the candid conversations, where you can share the challenges that you're facing in a private and safe space and get good advice and get different perspectives. Whereas sponsorship is really about having someone who has influence within the organization who can put your name forward for those plum roles, those plum assignments, the, the, the specific type of projects that will get you the type of exposure within the organization that really is what you need to move forward. Tell me about some of your goals since you assumed uh, the presidency of the organization. The biggest goal for me is to make sure that we've got the type of events, programming, and information that's really providing value to our members. Second, what I'm spending a lot of time is thinking about how do we continue to advocate for policies and positions that, that are aligned with our mission. But I also wanna make sure that we do that in a way that's data-driven. Um, we will be issuing, again, our 10th seat at the table report where we analyze board representation among New Jersey companies. And that's always a good opportunity for us to really understand and see what's going on in a very data-specific way that can help inform those advocacy positions we take. Finally, one thing that um, even prior to my being involved with EWNJ, I was not as appreciative of is the great work we do with our Graduate Merit, Merit Scholarship Program. Over the past 40 years, we've given out roughly $1.3 million in scholarship to women who have taken an alternative path to education. Um, so that's something I want to continue to look at building up the reserves that we have to support those scholarships. Well, good luck in your new role, and thanks so much for spending some time to speak with me. Thank you so much for your time, Rhonda. Take good care. 
in order for women to close the gap on pay equity, there needs to be some changes around child care access and family leave policies. I spoke about that with Lisa Kaplowitz, a finance professor at Rutgers Business School and executive director of the Rutgers Center for Women in Business. It's an interesting time for women in business. In some ways, we think there have been some positive strides, but then you look at something as basic as this gender pay gap, Pew Research doing some analysis that shows it really hasn't moved that much in two decades. Why is that? Why do we see this persistent pay gap? Women make about 82 cents on the dollar of a white man, and that's actually significantly less for black women and Hispanic women. Um, you know, there are a bunch of reasons, and it's not just all about fixing her. I think the pay equity is actually a lagging indicator. It's the result, but not the symptom. The biggest challenge, I think, Rhonda, is the fact that in the United States, we have a child care infrastructure crisis. So let me just jump in here on this and uh, parse this out a little bit. In New Jersey in particular, are we seeing any differences compared to what else is happening in the U.S.? We've done a lot about child care shortages. Is New Jersey um, outside of the norm in any positive way? We're right in the middle of this country um, with respect to the wage gap. It's, it really isn't that much better. Women do have control over their reproductive health, more re more control over their reproductive health. And that that's really important because that leads to even greater wage gaps. But the cost of living here in New Jersey is so high. And what was fascinating in that Pew research was that when working women feel the same pressure that working men feel to provide financial stability in their homes. However, working women that are partnered with children Two thirds of them also feel the pressure to be responsible for the home if they have kids under 19, where less than half of the men feel that pressure. So we are really talking about not having enough hours in the day. And so when we talk about the pay gap and we talk about some of the root causes and we talk about the division of labor that is so unequal in our homes, we need to have more policies that allow paid family leave for both men and women. Well, I wonder too why corporations have to wait for policy. Why don't corporations recognize the need that if they want their female workers to succeed, uh, they want them there. And so why are they not more proactive uh, to address some of these issues? So when I'm saying policy, I actually do mean the policy that these companies are creating to have family leave, the policies that the companies are creating to have flexible work arrangements. Those policies need to be practiced by both the men and the women. Lisa, it's been so good to speak with you today on this very important issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. New Jersey is filled with women who are breaking down barriers and running their own businesses, but it can still be tough being a woman, especially if you're working in a male-dominated industry. That's the case for Angela Rubino Hines, co-principal of Bovio Rubino Service, which is South Jersey's largest women-owned HVAC plumbing and electrical services company. Angela told me about some of the struggles she faced as she took over the business from her father. Angela, it's great to talk to you today, first of all. Yes, you as well. You really are in a fascinating business. You're a woman in a man's world. The HVAC business is not one dominated by women. How did you get into it? My father started the business in 1975. Uh, so I grew up in the business. Um, I was planning on coming into the business at some point after college, uh, but he had a stroke in 2004. So I came in and started running the business in 2004. So I've been running it since then. Sorry to hear about your father in terms of his illness. In terms of how that impacted you, what was it like to kind of just take the reins in this business? And was it more difficult because you are a woman? It was definitely a challenge in the beginning. And I think especially because I was a woman, I was looked at like I didn't know what I was doing. Um, 
I am not super technical, of course. I never been out in the field, but I do know how to run a business. I grew up in the business. So yes, I understand technical terms. I understand how things work. Um, as a woman, I definitely get past pass by and uh, industry events. Um, people talk around me, over me. They talk to people standing next to me. So it's definitely a challenge and I have to work extra hard to prove myself uh, in terms of my knowledge and my leadership skills. I'm always trying to like stay ahead of everything and have to work harder to prove that I know what I'm doing. I think it's a great lesson though for women to hear your story, to really kind of point out that a woman can do any kind of business and succeed. I 100% agree. I have two daughters and I tell them that all the time. You could do anything you want. Don't let anything stop you, no matter what you decide to do in life. And a great example is myself. I came into a business. I was kind of thrown into this. I didn't have uh, my support of my father because he was ill. So I had to really make my own way and improve myself, not only in the in my company itself, but in the industry. At this point, now that you've been running things really for quite some time, what's the biggest challenge you face now? In the industry, it's still a challenge. We, I go to trade you know, trade shows tra and trade events where my business partner uh, now is a man and they talk to him and not me. They assume I'm just his wife. I'm a secretary. Um, they talk around me still. I still have to correct people that I, my name is not babe or hun or sweetie, <laughs> but I do have a name. Oh boy. <laughs> it's cringy, right? You want to cringe. I hope we get beyond that at some point. <laughs> yes. Um, so I still have those challenges. I think things are definitely getting better. With that, as you know, the, the world is changing and evolving. And yes, there are more women coming into this field, especially now that there's like second and third generation of these companies, of the trade companies. We're starting to see more women getting involved. Well, I hope those challenges get easier for you. And I thank you so much for taking time to speak with us on NJ Business Beat. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Given some of the issues faced by working women, companies need to double down on retention, making sure their female employees feel valued and have opportunities for advancement. So how do they keep valuable workers from walking out the door? We decided to check in with one company which has many women on its board and on staff. The YMCA of Greater Monmouth County was named one of the best companies to work for by NJ.com. I spoke with Lori Goganser, the Y's president and CEO. Lori, first of all, congratulations on winning that best workplace honor, being recognized for what's going on at the Y. And we'd love to hear what is this supportive work environment that you have figured out that really helps your female employees? You know, Rhonda, thank you so much for having me. Um, having been working for the YMCA for 30 years uh, in different parts of the country, I can say that the YMCA has a tendency to draw women to come work for us. Uh, we are a real um, nurturing work environment, and I think we attract uh, folks who like to give back and to support other people, and uh, it, eventually that ends up being mostly women. So at the YMCA right now, I think 77% of our workforce are female, and um, they love the work. Work they get to do, but we also do our best to create an environment that's um, nurturing for them as well. And I think benefits not just themselves, but their entire families, because that's really what it's about, right? If they feel that there's a, a sense of belonging and a sense of support um, for them so that they can get to work, um, we find that that's kind of the secret in the sauce, so to speak. So how do you create that nurturing environment that gives people a sense of belonging? What are you doing that makes people excited to come into work every day. Right now, our vice president of child care has benefited from having worked for the wife for over 30 years in her career. And one of the ways she was able to do it is because we have uh, provided her with affordable child care for her own two children who now uh, are in college and come back in the summers to come work for us. So we've afforded folks the opportunity to uh, have a safe place for their children when they come to work. Um, and I think that really does help us get women out of the homes, into the workforce. You made so many great points there. And child care is a big issue. Earlier on the program, I talked to another guest who said that is so important in terms of women in the workplace. Uh, you said you care about your employees. We we think about you go to work and you, you do your job, but caring is kind of a whole different level. Is that what you think um, has helped you 
earn that honor of top workplace is the feelings you've been able to impart to your employees? What we love about this award is that our staff actually were the drivers of this. They were surveyed and they were asked questions and they gave us such good feedback on job satisfaction, career growth opportunities, and creating a culture of support for them. And so that feedback is what got us here today to be one of the top workplaces, which we're so proud to be. Um, but I can just say that fostering that environment, um, it's, it's, it's a tough road for women. You know, if you think about it, um, one in four women are in C-suite positions nationally. And to go even further with that, one in 20 are women of color. And so we recognize that we've got to create an environment where women can actually thrive, where they can grow professionally. Well, Lori, it was really great talking to you. I can tell you, I actually used to be an employee of a Y, a local Y. So I remember the environment very well. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And that does it for us this week. Remember to subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. Coming up next week, we take the pulse of New Jersey's growing entertainment industry. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you here next weekend. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org. And for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits.